One of my favorite websites um, is a uh, thing called Successories. They used to have stores, now they only have the, uh, they only have the website. This company started as a, a mail order business featuring beautiful posters and plaques that had success oriented themes. As I said, for many years it was uh, very successful in opening stores across America that provided every kind of stationery and knick-knack and poster and gadget that had printed on them a message that, that, that gave the buyer an insight into how someone could obtain success. So on beautiful posters, for example, they had things that said, uh, attitude is a little thing that makes a big difference. Or the speed of the leader determines the rate of the pack. Or success is a journey, not a destination. And all these things on beautiful posters. Now there's a great demand for these products because the need to succeed, to reach goals, to feel a sense of accomplishment is basic to every, every person. Even Paul the Apostle was eager to succeed in evangelizing places where no one had been before. And he talks about that in Romans chapter 15, verse 20. And so to desire success is natural and it's a good thing. How we as Christians obtain success is another matter. Like all good things, Success can become an occasion of sinfulness, a way to cause us to stumble in our walk of faith with the Lord. If we're not careful, the striving for success can lead us into sin in, in three main ways. And I want to share that with you this morning. First of all, we make success our God. You know, where your treasure is, there will be your heart also, Jesus said, Matthew 6, verse 21. In other words, the thing that you value the most will be what you worship and serve. And so if, you, uh, if succeeding, rather, is what your life is about, then succeeding in your job or succeeding in your hobbies or succeeding in winning at whatever, all your emotions and time and energy will be wrapped up in obtaining success. I had a, an elder, I worked in a church where there was an elder who once visited a member who had not been coming to services for several months. And so one of the elders you know, went out to visit with that family, with that particular individual to find out, is there something wrong? I mean, you know, are you sick? Whatever, you know, he hadn't been there in a long time. And the reply uh, that he received, it was a man, was that his time was devoted to schoolwork so he could get ahead in his job, he was taking courses, and he was also coaching on the weekend so his team could get to the championship and he said, I just don't have any time for church. You know, Jesus said, we cannot serve two masters. If success is our master, then God in Christ is not. And we found a new God for ourselves, and that God is called success. Success can cause us to sin in other ways. For example, we make success our standard. This is a more subtle trap, but an easy one to fall into. When success is very important to us, we begin to believe that it should be important to everybody else, that everyone should be success oriented like we are. As Christians, James tells us not to make distinctions between men. In other words, giving the rich man a favored position and place in the church and treating the poor man with contempt, James 2. Verses one to four. The danger here and the sin, according to James, is to judge the value and the worthiness of a person based on how they have succeeded in life. Jesus said life is more than food or clothing. Matthew 6, 25. In other words, there's more to a person than what they eat and the quality of what they eat or what they wear and the quality of what they wear. Yet some people will judge others simply by the appearance of success that they may have, and this judgment will usually guide the way that they treat them. Therein lies the sin of insincerity and selfishness caused by our false notion that a successful person is more worthy of our love than one who is not. 
You know, uh, I'm, I'm asking you to go back in your memory here. How many, how many people remember the monkeys? Remember the monkeys? Yeah, hey, hey, we're the monkeys. So Mickey Dolenz, he was a member of this uh, boy band back in the 70s. They had, they've had boy bands for a long time. Sorry to disappoint you younger people. So the monkeys were the boy band uh, of the 70s. And uh, Mickey Dolenz said that when he was famous and successful, everybody wanted to give him stuff for free. <laughs> they wanted to give him free stuff. And then after his fame and much of his wealth was gone, when he actually needed help, no one would give him the time of day. Imagine. Jesus died for everybody, irrespective of personal success. And so our judgment, therefore, should not be more exclusive than His. I think that's a basic thing, don't you think? And then a, another way that we can be trapped by the success idea, success at all costs. Now there are two strategies for success in the world. There's the high way, if you wish, to success. This is represented and encouraged by companies like Successories that I was mentioning before. They promote teamwork, excellence in work and product, innovation in approach and a continual motivation of individuals with incentives, encouragement and self-image builders that this company provided through their products. Another method is found in Stephen Covey's book a little while back, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And in this book, he stresses character. And he says that the development of one's character is the key to effective, successful living. In other words, it's not what you do, it's who you are that determines your success. And then there's the low way to success. And the low way says, do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes to get ahead. The low way's philosophy is that the end justifies the means. Cheat, lie, compromise yourself or your values. Just make sure you win. Seems there's a lot of that going around today, if you look at the news. Of course, the higher way is to be recommended, but one must be careful not to fall into the mindset of success, and that's what I've been talking about, where everything is calculated for maximum effect for success where character development and encouragement, where friendship and contacts are all weighed out against their usefulness for our success. It's one of the reasons that I've always been wary of some, not all, mind you, but some, you know, these multi-level marketing schemes. You know, the idea of seeing everybody as a potential customer and a stepping stone to greater personal success. I don't know about you, but the world gets awfully small uh, and one dimensional when the only reason everyone and everything exists is to provide me with the resources for my own success. I don't know, I don't want that life. Now the ideas of Christianity and success are not in opposition to one another. You know that it's somehow unchristian to succeed in the world? That, that's not a true statement. Our God is a God of success. He succeeded in creating the world that He intended to create. Our Lord Jesus succeeded in His very difficult mission to come here and die for our sins and resurrect and send out apostles. And the apostles succeeded in spreading the gospel and establishing the church in the Roman Empire against tremendous odds. And the Lord's church has succeeded in lasting 2,000 years despite constant attacks from every quarter. And it is stronger than ever. And of course, the Bible, God's word, has remained unchanged and unmoved and continues to save and encourage and teach and correct every new generation of believers. I think that that counts as success. And Christians and Christianity have a pretty strong record of success, better than any nation or government or philosophy or product. A thing I hold against successories, that company, however, is that it does not acknowledge God as the author of success in any way. It is only focused on success in this world. 
So Christians have a long track record of success and the Bible provides some principles that help us understand why they have succeeded and how we can succeed, not only in our religious life, but in every aspect of our lives as well. In other words, the Bible teaches us how to succeed not only spiritually, but physically as well. Much of what the success gurus preach comes from basic ideas that are found in the Bible. So you'll probably recognize a lot of the concepts. I just want to make sure that we realize that the things that I'll share with you actually come from God and not from man. So here it is, five ways to succeed as Christians. Number one, take a risk. Take a risk. There's no faith without risk. If what you do for God has no risk in it at all, it has, then you don't need any faith. You're walking by sight. Faith is all about taking a step, not knowing if that step will lead you to where you want to go. Noah risked his reputation in building a boat in the desert. Abraham risked his family in leaving for an unknown land. Moses risked his freedom in going back before the Pharaoh. David risked his life fighting Goliath. Apostles risked everything in following this young rabbi uh, from Nazareth. A recent survey of men over 90 years of age asked them what they would have changed if they could do everything over again. And they answered that they would, ha they would have risked more. I would have stepped out more. I would have gone for it. The Bible doesn't say to take foolish risks or sinful risks, but in order to get to somewhere or something else, we always have to risk what we have in hand. You know, one of the successory posters says the following, you cannot discover new oceans unless you're willing to lose sight of the shore. You want to succeed as a Christian? Take responsibility. No one ever succeeded on somebody else's hard work. Success in any endeavor requires that a person take the responsibility for failure and for success. Because nobody succeeds by accident. Sure, some people win the lottery, or publishing clearinghouse, or they buy a ticket, you know. Some folks inherit money. But the number of these people are tiny in comparison to the ones who succeed because they aim for it and they work hard to achieve it. Reminds me of the story of the farmer. He had a huge barn, a red barn. It had these uh, you know, bullseyes on it. And in these bullseyes, there was a, was a bullet hole right smack in the middle of every bullseye. Must have had 50 bullseyes drawn on his barn and, and, and there was a, a, a bullet in the middle of it. So his, his friend came over and said, man, you must be a terrific shot. You must be a terrific marksman. How do you do that? He said, yeah, no problem. You know, you, you know, the barn's about 100 yards from your house. So he went in and got his rifle. He aimed it at the barn, bang. You know, and then he walked over to the barn with a chalk and he drew a bullseye around the, <laughs> around the bullet. This story reflects how some people wander aimlessly until they reach a certain spot and then they circle their lives around it and they call themselves a success. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, I labored even more than all of them. He was explaining his response to God's grace and how it motivated him to work very hard in order to succeed in accomplishing all that he did in mission work. He knew where he was going. His gains were not by accident. You know, it's, a, it's an old story, but it's true. No pain, no gain. Like everybody else, Christians need to visualize their goals and be willing to sacrifice in order to achieve them. My success is my responsibility. If I achieve it, I will rejoice and I will give thanks. And if I fail, I will blame no one or nothing else 
except myself. Unless it's my responsibility, it'll never be my success. You want to be successful? Take a risk, take responsibility. Expect opposition. The reason so many people fail is because they quit the moment there is opposition or difficulty or pain. They think that opposition is God's way of telling them to stop. Or that if God wanted them to do something, He would give them a smooth ride as a sign. People who think that have not read carefully the Bible. With every opportunity, there comes opposition. That's why the mountaintop is up there and not down there. I didn't say that one has to like opposition and trouble and trials. I said, if you want to succeed in business, in marriage, in ministry, in personal conduct, in whatever, expect obstacles and adversaries, unexpected things to go wrong at the worst possible moment. Paul wrote to the Corinthians about a great opportunity to bring the gospel to Asia Minor, but listen to how he described this opportunity. He said, but I shall remain in Ephesus until Pente Pentecost, for a wide door of effective service has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Notice that, he says, I've got this great opportunity, and there are many adversaries. When we know there's going to be opposition, we can be calm, not discouraged, and ready to deal with it when it happens. Successful Christians understand that opposition is simply part of the cost of obtaining success. An open door of opportunity is never without some form of obstacles. Otherwise, everybody would be bold and courageous and successful. Want to succeed? Be prepared to lose it all. You know, Job was able to bear under his great suffering because he was prepared to lose it all if it came to that. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. The Lord gave and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If success is your God, your only game, your one motivation in life, you're in a bad bargaining position if your whole life is wrapped up in just pursuing success. If you lose, you lose everything, and you can be easily tempted to sell your soul for it. When success is part of your life, but not the focal point, you have the strength to start over when defeated, and you have the ability to find peace and joy regardless of your rate of success. And then finally, do you really, really want to succeed as a Christian? Yeah, of course, depend on God. Of course, depend on God. This is the key element that separates the Christian struggle for success and the rest of the world and what they do for success. For Christians, success is simply another way of expressing what is at the center of his or, or her life, and that is to glorify God. The goal for a Christian is to honor God and serve Him in Jesus Christ. The goal, or this goal rather, is perfectly reached through faith and obedience to Christ. Worldly success simply provides another avenue to honor the Lord. My success gives me greater opportunity to praise God. Education and skill, money, character, contacts, hard work, all of these are useful tools in obtaining success, but a Christian knows that his ultimate success depends on God. And so he does his best, but depends on God for the outcome. What does Solomon say about all of this? Commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. The wise man, the wise woman who seeks success seeks success through Christ. If your heart's desire is to please and honor God, He will delight. Solomon is saying He'll be happy to give you success. So in closing, just let me say my prayer is that every godly dream and hope and goal that you have will succeed for each of you 
as you pursue these, regardless of the risk, as you invest your energy into your goals, as you overcome every obstacle, ready to lose it all, if it's God's will, and as you put your full confidence in the Lord for final success, if you pursue success in this way, the Lord will surely bless you. My hope also for you is that every person in this congregation is ready when the Lord comes, that we all go to heaven will be the ultimate success. That all of you and I, of course, will be in heaven together. This eclipses any other success that we might have here on earth. This is my hope. This is what I pray for, for each of you, each of your family, each of your children. If you're not ready to fulfill that success because you've not obeyed the gospel in repentance and baptism or perhaps you've been sinful or unfaithful, whatever that is, guarantee that final success, you can do that now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.